Hi, Jessica. Hi, David. Really nice to have the opportunity to speak with you again. And yes, it is. We met first um, over a year ago, and um, you realised your true nature in the first conversation we had. We've spoken a few times since then, and it's uh, led to some quite interesting developments. So, yeah, it would be really nice if you could just begin by, well, saying a bit about yourself, especially the earlier part of your life and the, the, the way things have gone in terms of realisation. Sure. So, um, yeah, early on, I had a very good childhood from an outsider's perspective. There was no trauma. Uh, you know, I had a loving family, but it was internally right away. There was a lot of questioning of like, what is happening here? Mm. Why am I here? Mm. Uh, I remember probably around four or five like watching my sister pick out clothes, my older sister pick out clothes and my mom kind of talked to her about what kind of clothes they're going to buy for school and really just being perplexed by like, what, what are we, why are we doing this? And, um, you know, just really being observant, watching my parents work really hard and it, I couldn't figure out why, <laughs> why they were doing that. And by middle school, I mean, my first entry in my middle school diary was, what is the point of this? And it said, it looks like we're all just here to die. Uh, and that was in the background always, like this kind of looking of trying to figure out what's the point of this. Hmm. And I ended up in counseling pretty early in my life and therapy and it was not a great experience for me privately, like personally. Mm. Uh, but there was a lot of good moments too. Mm. And by high school, I discovered alcohol and that really helped with <laughs> not answering the questions, but like drowning the questions out, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And uh, I fully entered into that party scene and latched onto it for a good 10 years. Mm. That's and nice. uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, throughout college and I was still a good student and, you know, still a good daughter and, um, but there was definitely this like, urge to drown out that existential thinking because it seemed to mm. not lead to any answers. Did you find and, that many of your friends just didn't have those questions? They were just living their life without those questions. I would say, yeah, none of them had those questions. There was the occasional person I would meet. I had a couple of friends in high school and those are still the two closest friends that I have today. Mm. And they and, were asking similar questions, were they? Right. Hmm. Yeah. Just not getting too invested into what everyone was telling hmm. us was the hmm. truth, hmm. you know? Hmm. Um, so then in college, uh, like I went on to grad school and got my master's and became a speech therapist and got a job and got the life that I kind of was just told to get. I mean, I had, I could care less what I did really in school. So I kind of let my parents pick my, my career path because it mm. just didn't make a difference to me. I was more focused on having fun and I could not think of anything that really felt like it fit for me anyway. Mm. Even though now that I look back on it, writing has always been there. I mean, I was mm. winning writing contests throughout school and it, like even to get into graduate school I won an essay writing contest that got me a scholarship mm. the writing was always there but it just never occurred to any of us to make that a career path mm. um so you know I, I was told it wasn't a practical career path anyway 
we overlook the skills which are just naturally there, don't we? Because it comes so easily, you tend not to even consider it. Right. Yeah, that's completely right. And so then at, by my late 20s, drinking had become kind of old, partying had become kind of old, and mm. I was getting old, so like hangovers were, were present now, and mm. that wasn't fun. And I had started getting sick. So um, about two years into my career as a speech therapist, I started really like I would sleep from the time I got home from work until the next morning. I was just so mm. tired. Mm. Um, all day I was tired. I was achy. Mm. There was depression and anxiety were always around. I mean, I tried different medications for that. And I got diagnosed with autoimmune disorder that affects the thyroid. So the throat. Yes. Yeah. And that was a whole new identity I got to attached to was being this person with this autoimmune disorder and hmm. and just putting I had such a good time like putting focus into that and trying to find the right specialist and spending all my money on supplements and um just trying to heal myself I really liked that path <laughs> I like your honesty <laughs> Uh, and let's see, I had started seeking pretty hardcore around that time as well, spiritually seeking, you know, just trying to find people on the internet that were talking about spirituality and, uh, me and my boyfriend at the time ended up moving to New York and my friend, one of the friends who I had a connection with in high school, who was also into this stuff he lived in in new york city at the time and so i finally had someone i could talk to on like a daily basis we'd always get together and and just walk around and talk about this stuff and i had been hearing about a course in miracles and had never seen it or read it but i was intrigued and i mentioned it to him and he said oh i have that i he, he said something like i randomly got it one day at a book and for some reason bought it, but he not, he, he cracked it open. He's like, it didn't make any sense to me. So you can just have it. And so he brought it to me the next time we saw each other and <laughs> my body had a physical reaction just to holding that book. A, a like good reaction. a good reaction. Right. I mean, just like a, a sh just a shaking kind of, but it felt mm. like, um, yeah, a good kind of shaking, like, um, and so anytime I would open it up and read it, I felt great. Hmm. And it was like it bypassed the thinking, the over analytical hmm. mind. Hmm. And when, because I didn't really understand a lot of what it was talking about. But I was at the same time, I, I wanted to read it so badly. Hmm. And um, I don't know if you've heard of Marianne Williamson. She's yeah. actually running for president here in the United States. And she is a teacher of A Course in Miracles. And she was living in New York at the time. And I went to see her speak. And I was just really all about that book and hmm. what it had to say. And I had some other really neat experiences in New York, like finding a Reiki healer that uh, she was a really unique person. She used to be, she used to work for the CIA actually, and then got, you know, kind of saw what that was all about and said, I have to get out of here. And she <laughs> retreated to go lo live in the woods for a year and came out of that be having these great healing abilities and she was also a stand-up comedian which i thought was a great combination yes yeah but i had some really really neat experiences with her where um you know i would leave and i the mind i i couldn't hear the thoughts hmm. uh the mind had been detached hmm. and uh 
but I didn't know what was happening. You know, I, I, it would scare me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I would, you know, I would quickly consent to invitations of fear and like, this shouldn't be happening. And I had a virtual reality experience there that did the same thing. It really, um, like after I took that headset off, I remember like three days walking around and there were no thoughts and, um, you know, it was just really clear that how quickly I could have adopted that headset reality as reality. And so when I took it off, it was just really clear, like that this could be the exact same mm. thing. Yes. Yeah. And because I didn't have a good foundation of what truth is, that also sent a lot of invitations of fear mm -hmm. uh, that I consented to. And so it was back into suffering after that. Mm -hmm. And um, then I went on to start a family. I had a child and the whole time I was pregnant, I, I read A Course in Miracles every day and it was a really great experience. Even childbirth was ended up being a really great experience. But then <laughs> it's like once I held him in my arms, everyone says like, oh, the love that you feel. And it was the opposite. I mean, it was like the fear that I felt was so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that I had adopted of what a mom is supposed to be like, I was consenting to such a confined, um, pressure filled, fearful filled concept of being a parent. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that's been a challenging one. Uh, so that can, I ended up getting on medication for anxiety and depression and that really led to the end of my relationship. So I ended up moving out and getting my own place. And that felt that resonated with something in me, like being on my own for once living by myself. I thought, okay, I know this is right, but there was still a lot of suffering. Mm -hmm. And that's when my brother, we've kind of always also been on the spiritual path together he he told me he's like have you heard of francis lucille and non-duality or advaita vedanta and i was kind of at a point where i'm like alex i can't i can't do another path hmm. i can't get my hopes up again like i just need to up my medication i think because nothing has worked i keep getting my hopes up and it doesn't end up being the answer but I watched some videos and it did seem like a different message, or at least there was a resonance there that, that felt like, okay, I want to keep going with this. And I can't remember now if he found your videos or if I think I did, it was one of your videos on conscious TV. And there was definitely something about it that was like, okay, I need, I need to reach out to him. And I did. And, and there, I had a lot of hope writing on our call. And I think it was an hour and a half into the call. And I still was just like, oh, it's not, I'm the one person it's not going to happen for. This is not working. And, and that is exactly what I said to you was, why does it work for some people and not for others? And you said, well, that question isn't even valid because you're not Jessica. Mm -hmm. And that, that shut me up. <laughs> that, uh, ha that gave me the space between the invitations and and truth and, and allowed me to decline those invitations of the mind.
and I could feel my heart opening. I could feel my throat opening. And there was just a seeing there that, that was unlike my other glimpses and several days of just being exactly what I knew, like having life be what I knew it could be. And um, yeah, so after those few days, you know, I, the, the habits creep back in of, of uh, consenting to things. And, um, but there was still this, like you say, uh, how do you say it? A foundation of truth. Hmm. And it was like, I, I didn't dip below a certain point of suffering. It was like, I knew there was some stability there now. And I think it was a month or two after we had spoke and I was sitting outside my backyard. Uh, I was, I had a fire going and I just, it was a really beautiful day. And I just had this thought of, I wonder what I could write about. And then the thought came to me, I don't think David Bingham has written a book. And without even really looking into it, I just emailed you and asked if you would like help writing a book. And I couldn't believe that I think it was like within the hour <laughs> that you responded that, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, that's so, yeah, it's incredible, really, the speed at which everything just unfolded. But, um, yeah, the, the, the way um, there was just the inspiration to do that, the way, uh, you know, writing is a skill that's totally natural to you. Uh, and, and then also the clarity, um, you know, in terms of, realizing your true nature it it just sort of came about really effortlessly which is uh yeah it's amazing really so i think it was only it was sort of late 2022 um when you sent the email so just within a few months um mm -hmm. you've managed to write the book and I, I really like the way you've done it because it's um it's very concise and it's clear so it's it's just a really good introduction to realization. And I'm sure, um, well, the way you describe the way it came to you, it sort of just flowed through you. And um, I remember you saying you felt as though you didn't even write it somehow. It, it was really remarkable because it was like, you know, this body mind was writing it. Mm. <laughs> but um, it was like what was being written was being written for me mm. uh like I I wrote it and then I would read it and it's like that was the exact information I needed at that time um so you know I feel like most of the time you you learn about something and then you write about it mm. but this was the opposite it was like it was the words were teaching me what I needed to know next and then I would see it play out in this life mm. and um you know, there would be often weeks in between writing. And that was because something needed to integrate or, you know, something needed to play out here for me to kind of have the inspiration and the information to write the next chunk of writing. So, um, yeah, it was really neat how it came together. Mm. And I like the idea of, which you suggested of it um, uh, being an ebook, just so it's very easily available to everyone, and um, that, that's so it's it's like a handbook in a way because it just gives um, it gives a really good introduction. But you you've included some quite um, simple exercises in there, which I feel are helpful too. So. Um, yeah, it's interesting that quite you know quite a long time ago I considered a book, but then it never really came to be because everything continually evolves. But then this time it just sort of happened so easily, and um, 
it's just come together so it's yeah it, it, it's really nice to um to have that available yeah it, it's certainly been helpful for me and i hope it's helpful for other people as well but yeah it's it's not a long book and i think i think that's important because you know what we are is so simple yes that to add too many words to it kind of doesn't yes, make sense it doesn't serve any purpose no yeah um you know we even talk about words in the book and mm. and um and language and yeah to make it too wordy would kind of point away from truth at some point i think yes yeah well as w uh, we are essentially non-conceptual then words can't um they, they're not always helpful exactly yeah and I think that that's, you know, um, like that's what happened with A Course in Miracles and with m my speaking to you. I don't think any of it is the words. It's no. the energy uh, transmission of it. Hmm. You know, I don't think that it's necessarily that exact sentence that you say to people. It's hmm. like something about the energy in that moment uh, transmits it. And yes. it's nice to know that um, a book can have that as well, because mm. I know, and, and like your YouTube videos, I know that people are having realizations just watching yes. the videos, which is incredible. Yeah, that's really um, the, the way things just unfold. And the, the book is the same as the way those videos have come about, really, which is the, it's a sequence in the way the self is revealing itself um, more and more effortlessly. So um, I'm sure the timing of the book is perfect in, in that sense. And it's, you know, it's going to be available for, um, you know, lots of people. So, yeah. That's, yeah, that's great. I would like to to print it at some point, um, you know. And have I just... a look at paperback. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see, maybe in the next few months, I can get that done. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the editor for the book I wanted to talk about, because that oh, came about so effortlessly. So, you know, we had kind of talked about having some people proofread it and look it over. And I had done this one other time. I had written a book for a friend of mine. And so I had used a website called Readsy where you can find editors and proofreaders. And um, I, you know, they cost, they can cost quite a bit of money. And so I just thought, I'll just look and see if there's someone out there that looks like a good fit, but if not, we'll just use friends and family and they can help us edit it. And so I went on there and there was, I think I just typed in, I either typed in non-duality or spirituality. And there was a, quite a few that came up, but there were only two that really stood out to me as being like, maybe they could be a good fit. And I messaged them with a sample of the book. Mm. And one of them came back with a, a pretty pricey quote of what it would cost to edit it. And then the other woman, um, Clelia, she wrote back and said, this is amazing. This is exactly what the information that I'm integrating into my life right now. I can't believe it just showed up. I mean, she was ecstatic to have received this message. And she said, usually I, I, I won't do jobs. I won't accept jobs below a certain price point, but she said it would be a pleasure to work on this. So um, for, you know, next to nothing, she did a couple different edits and the proofread and it was really great how that worked out mm. yeah that's lovely really the way you describe that so mm -hmm. good. <laughs> and then towards the end of writing the book I was kind of not knowing when it should end or how it should end and then um I had started hiking and just going on walks in nature by myself around that time and 
I started getting the this inspiration for a completely different book, a book of my own mm. and um, a fiction book at that, which I've only ever written nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of like, okay, I need like the ideas were coming so quickly and I wanted to write them down. And I thought, okay, I want I want to wrap up David's book like this is a clear indication that it's at the end and it, it can be wrapped mm -hmm. up. And, um, so that was really neat how that worked out. Yeah, so nice the way the inspiration for your own book came um, so, so soon afterwards. Yeah. And it, it's, um, it, it, when you try to think of creative ideas, they're never the ones that work out. The ones that you really try, like, what should I? Yes. Yeah. Um, all creativity well, it, comes from, just comes from the body of wisdom. So it just comes effortlessly, really. Yeah. And how have things been for you, Jessica? Um, be, because during this whole period, it's because there is usually quite a dramatic period. Well, there can be quite a dramatic period of integration um, in the first few months following realization. But you seem in a really good space, which is so nice to see. Yeah, I would say a lot. I mean, there's been a lot that has happened in this last year. I was able to get off medication for anxiety mm -hmm. and depression. And, you know, I know a lot of people have a hard time with that. I didn't even notice a difference when I got off of it. There was no, like, a return of, of despair or anything. I mean, there, there have been some moments where there's invitations into that and some days when I've consented to those mm -hmm. invitations. But knowing what they are now, it never becomes that the low is not as low as yes. it used to be. and um it has certainly been nice to have my brother as someone who is also on this into non-duality and has spoken to you and um to have him to reach out to hmm. and i hope the other people like i feel like you've created this great little community of people on your YouTube channel. And I know I was too, I was inspired by some of the videos and wanted to reach out to people and didn't. Hmm. And because I had my brother there, I could just reach out to him, but I hope that other people um, can, can reach out. Cause I feel like we all just want to help people hmm. on the path. And yeah, well, it's so nice that there are um, others who've realized their true nature and they're helping because um, it's really to do with resonance. And I've had lots of emails where people, you know, they write to me and say, oh, it's so nice that um, I've spoken with and, that you know, they mention the person. And it's, um, yeah, it's so nice, especially the female perspective. You know, it's it's good that there are lots of people where there's realization and they can speak with each other. But it, it yeah. was um, before we started recording this conversation. Uh, it was quite nice the story you were saying about your brother, the way he has um, changed things around in his life, and just the way it's working really nicely for him. Yeah, he he really has been dedicated, and um, there's been a lot of changes now happening for him that you know they just fit. That it just is effortless. Mm. And so a new job, new relationship. And um, just to see how comfortable he is with all of it mm. is so nice to see, you know. Mm. Mm. And I'm still, uh, <laughs> I mean, like I was telling you, I knew um, that effortless being would take care of I had some anxiety this week about the call and about different things. My son starting kindergarten. And I kind of thought like, well, this can't be a good week to do the call. There's just too much going on. But then there's this knowing that, no, I know it's the perfect time for the call and that things will work out yes. to be prepared for that. Yes. Yeah. And so even just last night, having this 
seeing of, um, well, I know you've said to me, it's almost like you've lived kind of in the background Mm. and, um, just this seeing that I've been consenting to, um, you don't want to make other people feel uncomfortable or envious, you know, like you got, you you should play it small because Mm. it it would, it's a bad thing to make, to be too happy or successful. Mm. Um, and, and this belief that to feel good is a sin. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, because most of the times in my life when I felt good, I have been doing something that adults wouldn't approve of <laughs> like the, the grownups in my life wouldn't have approved of. And so there's this belief that, yeah, just for the body to feel good, you that's, that's wrong. That's inappropriate. You got to have some kind of shame or guilt going on. You know, you can't just be walking around happy and um, just really seeing that so clearly yesterday. And um having a really good laugh about it <laughs> that's uh, that's so nice that's such a nice story but it's um it's great to um just see that things can happen in personally because um most of the experiences you describe are to do with the personalized realm of experience but the nice thing is when when we're functioning from impersonal being rather than in the personal mode then everything in can just you know develop as it does but with no attachment to it and and then so there isn't any need to kind of regulate it or or monitor it or 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 to um, kind of review it in terms of the way people feel about it because there isn't that same sense of authorship on a personal level and um but yeah i i've i've well i said i said that to you early on really that um there was something that was really limiting your potential that you um, you know certain beliefs in place where well just the way you describe it that you felt as though you didn't really want to reveal your natural abilities because um, you know it, well just in uh, in the way they may be received but I think that's true of all humans really I think that we you know we have the opportunity just to let things come through and it's um, it's usually things which are ju- which just come so easily to us and they're the ones we overlook as you did with your writing yeah um i with the the throat and the thyroid stuff um mm. when i started reading a course in miracles and and really having deep meditations i would notice that my jaw would open really wide and I came up with my own stories about that. Mm. Um, But recently I've seen that the body wants, it it doesn't want to be controlled by the mind. No. Uh, Yeah. And just really seeing how um, there's involuntary movements in the body when we're consenting to things and to limitations yeah yeah and for this body a lot of that was happening in the throat yes well that makes sense because um our natural abilities are the ones which you know can sort of come to the fore and i i think for you it is expression and communication really which is um you know just a natural ability you have so you, the the invitations we receive and the the restrictions are actually giving us an insight into really what um, we should be allowing to come forward. And I I think that's how it is with you. I think because there were those feelings of um, well hiding your lamp under a bushel is a that's an <laughs> expression, <laughs> but it, it's really. Um, it's because the natural ability is there so wherever we feel as though we can't step forward that's really the thing just to be effortlessly allowing so that um you know that energy can come through but it was um it it, yeah it's it's nice that um 
we've actually managed to have a conversation because we we spoke a few times and I said, well, it would be really lovely to record a conversation about your realisation, but you were always a little bit reluctant. So it was only when you wrote the book that you agreed to it. So that's, yeah. that's been so nice, though. Yeah. Well, there is definitely... Um, you know, when when there's a focus on the personal is mm. when there's the consenting to invitations. And mm. but um, I feel like on any of the shifts that have been made have been when there's a focus on I, I like how Rhonda Byrne puts it like you've likely had hundreds or thousands of lifetimes. There's nothing so special about this one. Mm. You know, it's really truth mm. that's special. Yes. Yeah. And we talk about this life because, you know, this is what's happening. So th this is what we can tell a story about. Mm. There's not a lot of story to tell about truth. Mm. <laughs> you know, yeah. there's no story. Mm. But, um, but yeah, that's certainly where I've seen the gains is when I'm focused on the impersonal. Mm. yes yeah and even with emotions um i'm noticing that, you know there there's been a lot of investment in beliefs around the emotions being difficult to subdue or difficult to you know control but um more recently i'm noticing that it's possible just to turn them off you know so that we can we can keep all the good ones on so things like love and compassion and you know, the highest sort of emotions, but then anything that's disturbing, um, it is possible just to turn them off. But um, that's, um, you can just see how the infinite self is kind of revealing itself further and uh, things which previously seemed very difficult, you come to see are actually quite easy. Yes. Uh, e even just this week there's I was inspired to kind of <laughs> just do different things like hold my forehead like this mm. and uh and just not like preventing certain constrictions in your body mm. how that can um detach the energy of the mind from that part of the body yes and so I did that for my parents yesterday they were scheduled to have their anniversary party and it got rained out and they were both feeling stressed. And so I just tried that on them with different points where they hold tension and have reactions mm. and they, <laughs> they were speechless <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> and uh, my dad instantly, what's that called? And where can I sign up for it? He's on his phone. Who can, who can do that for me all the time? <laughs> um, but seeing that that, is what happens when my jaw opens during meditation. It's the body restricting that physical consent, that that yeah. contraction reaction. And and really, when you can see that the body can remain completely calm mm. in the face mm. of these stressful thoughts, mm. it's mm. just so it's it's amazing. Mm. You know, it's so freeing. Mm. Well, thanks so much, Jessica. That's been so nice. It's been a nice introduction to um, the book. And um, yeah, really nice to hear about the way things are progressing for you. And um, it's always inspiring. There are several people I've had conversations with where they've actually come off medication, <clears throat> uh, you know, for different things, really. But uh, yeah, it's um, th that's something that people kind of consent to in a way they consent to the um the liberation from that kind of medication mm -hmm. yeah so, that's been um you know my my brother had also kind of struggled with that in consenting to anxiety and just seeing that even there's a belief that um that an anxious body is bad is mm. is um, mm. a good one to unplug from yeah yeah <laughs> well jessica thank you so much it's been lovely to have a conversation with you and um 
Yeah, well, I'm sure the book will be of value to many people. It's something that can be read in a few hours. So that's, uh, yeah, that's going to be nice to see where that goes, really. But the the way the whole thing has developed effort, effortlessly, it's just, you know, we each kind of consent or, you know, allow things to come through. So just, you know, your inspiration initially, and then, you know, we've we've had one or two conversations and then clearly uh, coming along as well, that's been perfect. So um, we'll just see see where it goes, really. Yeah, sounds good. And we should tell people the book is called Effortless Being. Yes. By David Bingham. And it's on Amazon. And I'm sure you can include the link below the video. We'll do that, yes. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, uh, yeah it's been... A pleasure. I mean, I'm so glad that I've gotten to do this. It's been amazing to get to work on the book and to have so many conversations with you. And, you know, I consider you a friend now. So definitely. And yeah, yeah to see where it goes for you as well, because I'm sure your natural um, ability in terms of communication and writing is something that, you know, it's just the beginning, really. Yeah, I think so. So, yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you, David. Thanks, Jessica.